Okay, so I'm going to welcome Fredrik Söderblom, Joakim Strömbergsson och Peter Norin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, welcome. Um, nice to have you all here. Hopefully we can get drunk afterwards. So we're going to talk and we're going to tell you a little about the story uh, regarding an audit we did uh, actually quite some time ago. But um, it has a lot of lessons um, that you can learn from it. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is me, yeah. uh, Joachim Stromisson. Uh, I work as an uh, embedded security consultant in Gothenburg. Uh, I do a lot of crypto stuff for embedded devices. And that's about it. Uh, next okay. slide, please. Uh, my name is Fredrik Söderholm. I work for XPD. We are a small IT security company um, operating out of Sweden, doing mainly work in um, the European community and, and in the US. <coughs> Next slide. Uh, we uh, had this uh, interesting customer. They had um, deployed a very large new system, which was literally thousands of sites uh, that was actually organized in a star topology. Um, it was a fairly new installation. It was geographically dispersed. And what they wanted was they wanted a security review of the system. So they contacted us and, and we started to work on it. And the scope was basically doing an IT audit, trying to identify any weaknesses we could find within uh, the different communication links. And the three primary communication links that we were looking at was data, which is basically where we were expecting to see all of the problems, the alarm systems and the video link. And um, each site, and we were talking several hundreds of sites, had these three different communication links going out to them. Next slide, please. Data traffic obviously uh, flows, and, and this customer has a, t a very typical, oh, not typical, but uh, rather odd setup. So it's truly a star topology. You have traffic that's meant to flow from a central site uh, out to the branches. And it's not supposed to be branch-to-branch uh, -branch communication. Everything is meant to go to the central site. It's sensitive traffic. Um, it's from many different perspectives. Uh, clearly not a good thing if you can enter uh, alter the data or... or um, eavesdrop on the data. The alarm system, <coughs> the second communication link is, well, yeah, it's used for the alarm system. And it's basically um, an alarm system that sits on every of these multiple hundreds of sites. The alarm system um, has a lot of features. One of the features, ob obviously, that it can give an alarm to the central, security central, if someone tries to break in. But it can also open doors and etc. And, others, and other funny stuff that actually makes it kind of scary if, if we find any type of odd things within the system. And um, as icing on the cake, the alarm system actually had a GPRS-based backup, which made this even more interesting. But to be honest, we didn't expect to see anything uh, out of the ordinary from the alarm system. We were expecting to see troubles on the data communication link. And this is where also the customer had focused us to, to believe that there could be some problems on the data side. Um, and lastly, we also had a video communication um, channel, a VRF, that was meant to stream video, IP-based video, uh, from each branch into the central site. Yeah. Oh. Does it work? Yeah. OK, so I missed the introduction. I'm Peter from uh, XPD as well. So just to give, you, to give you a lay of the land. So the, from a network perspective, uh, this is just a sample site. It's going to be hundreds or even thousands of these installations all over. And uh, 
typically they buy it from a provider, uh, dividing it into uh, three different VRFs uh, based on MPLS, which is kind of normal setup. I mean, you buy a private virtual network from a provider. Now, <coughs> like Frederick said, this is uh, like a or what would you call it, the uh, uh, hub and spoke kind of thing. But <coughs> lessons learned from this is that uh, when you buy the VRFs, VRFs and the MPLS networks, you really need to actually, I mean, you delegate the, the security of your protocols and so on to your provider. Now, I worked at a provider and I know for a fact that, for instance, in order to accomplish SLAs and stuff like that, you actually tap the VRF at one point to measure inside of VRF, for instance. So what you need to do is actually uh, protect the transport, or otherwise you have to uh, delegate the security down to the protocols that are actually communicating. In this setup, it's a full mesh, so everyone can talk to everyone, and the security or the virtual network, private network, is MPLS, which is basically kind of the same thing like you would expect from a, a regular VLAN. It's just a label, a tag, whatever. It's, it's still going to be clear text. So the conclusion from the overview is basically once you're in, you're in. And that's it. So yeah, the next. So there you have a rough <laughs> overview of how complicated this is. And uh, based from the fact that this is just uh, MPLS, it's going to be a flat network. All right. So like I said, the network is operated by third party. It's not the, the actual customer. It's not their main site. It's actually like uh, what you would expect, like one of the big operators in town. Uh, and this is a lesson, I think, a lot of companies that really doesn't know this technology. It's often referred as like an IP VPN, so it's secure. It's a VPN, encrypted. But yeah, it's labels. Yeah, you can go to the next one. Uh, and the difference between a v VLAN and the MPLS label switching is basically that you ha have your own routing tables. And one thing to take away from this as well, I mean, if you buy this from a big operator in Sweden like Telia, TDC, or T uh, Teletu, or whatever, it's going to be the same infrastructure that runs the internet or whatever. So, potentially. So, a breach there and you're, you're done. So you have to do something else on top of this. And also, the provider is going to be at every site, so you have an excellent spot for man in the middle, and yet again, delegating the security down to the, the protocol level, which is going to be the more and more interesting part of this discussion, I think. Yeah, you can. So, so like I previously said, more or less, they have three VRFs, uh, not directly connected to each other. So uh, basically, what, what you do with a VRF in that label, in, in that VLAN, uh, it's not a VLAN, but I'm just trying to use that as uh, like a, something you're probably more familiar with. But in, in that segment or that network, you have your own routing table, for instance. So this is three separate networks that doesn't really connect to each other, but they're still transporter over the same equipment. Uh, so they have one for the video, and uh, one for the critical data transport of uh, their main application. Uh, the alarms, of course, and, and the video to su have the surveillance of, of these high security uh, areas. So, yeah. And this is kind of the essence of what I've said all along. Keep this in mind when we go further on onto the protocol analysis and stuff like that. And, and this was also a big surprise for the customer because they, they weren't aware of this. Yeah, it, uh, and that's true as well because the customer just bought a big network. We're going to have a thousand sites or 500 or whatever the number is. 
and they have no uh, technical perspective, so they, they assume, of course, that they're going to get what they, w what they want, but they don't expect the side benefits of having the, the fully mesh. Each uh, site is connected to each other instead of the actual required uh, communication pattern, which is from the sites to a central hub in, in terms of the data, it's the central site for their uh, main system. For uh, alarms, it's to the alarm central, and for video, uh, probably alarm central as well, right? But this is, I mean, so you can, uh, you, you can see where this is going. If you have a breach at one site, and uh, I mean, if you have a thousand sites, chances are some of them are going to have issues, right? So everyone is uh, directly connected to each other. And like I said, it, it's more or less industry standard, I would say, or not industry standard, but best practice to actually do uh, like an IPsec tunnel or something over the transport network. In this case, it's not done. So it's just up, up to the actual providers. And the encryption here, I mean, uh, the providers is not going to, you're going to have a lot of issues because if the provider when you're debating this with your provider, because as long as you start doing uh, the tunnels and stuff like that, you're going to not be able to do QS. So you're not going to see the actual traffic flowing. You're just going to see IPsec tunnels and stuff like that. So what are you going to prioritize here? Uh, and also, uh, this was also a typical salesman type of problem because the customer thought they bought an IP VPN. That's a virtual private network. Well, big surprise for them. There's, not, there's no privacy in this network. It's just an MPLS cloud. There's yeah. no IPsec tunnels deployed whatsoever. And also, uh, when you deploy this, who, who's going to be responsible for your uh, actual uh, encryption keys and, and the endpoints doing the encryption? I mean, if you do that at the CPE, which the provider provides, then, well, what's the point? So, of course, it's going to be an additional cost to place yet another CPE after the actual CPE, right? So it probably comes down to what kind of agreement you have and uh, also some sort of risk analysis and stuff like that. In this case, though, they didn't have a clue. And while presented by this, they were kind of shocked, I would say. Yep, yeah, absolutely. So the customer was under the impression they were actually having um, true encryption from the central site out to every, every branch. And just by examining the, the basic topology and the configuration, we could tell them that, well, everything is going in clear text here, and your provider can read and alter any data basically transmitted on all the three communication links. So we had the usual suspects when we did this, um, when we started this audit. And as a wise man uh, once told me, you should never assume anything because that will make an ass out of you and me. And basically, we found some issues with the data link. They were not as grave or serious as the things we found on the alarm system. Uh, examining the traffic, some of it was clear text, some of it was encrypted. We found self-signed CAs, that's obviously not quite good. Might be okay depending on, on the policies. Uh, we found um, <coughs> CAs, CAs using um, keys that were way too short. Uh, we found clients trying to negotiate SSL version 3. Uh, the server insisted, insisted on TLS version 1, which was kind of good. Um, these issues um, being, in the uh, being in the report was actually mitigated. Uh, so proper CAs now and TLS version 1.2. So it's probably fine. worth mentioning also that this is not really like a, uh, any normal system. It's a critical infrastructure where this cannot be down at any time, more or less. No. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of tough to upgrade, yeah. Um, so the video link, um, well, how hard is it to do um, video? One would expect that's also one of those things you shouldn't do. 
um, well, the video is, is transported over HTTP. Why on God's earth did they, why didn't they use HTTPS? No one knows. So basically, we could capture all the video images going back and forth between the, the um, IP cameras and, and the central station. Um, yep. The, this is where we got it, get it actually to start to get interesting. And they were this close to get away with it. And um, so we said, OK, the alarm system. So we shot off a couple of questions to the security provider. And we asked them stuff like, well, um, the alarm system, obviously it's OK, isn't it? Yeah, they said, well, it's, it's encrypted. You don't have to worry about it. For your audit, you can mark it as with a big check mark. It's fine. Everything is encrypted. OK, are you using encryption? Oh, what kind of encryption are you using? Are we using, uh, heck, what is it called? Uh, I think we're using AES-256, actually. So you don't need to bother. OK. So we said, OK, that sounds interesting. And, and we were basically almost ready to say, OK, the alarm system seems fine. But we said, OK, they seemed a little bit not too knowingly about the, object, <coughs> about the subject. So let's just shoot a couple of more questions just to get some more information to make sure that we're not out on deep water here. So we bombarded them with some questions, which is kind of very normal question when it comes to cryptography. OK, sounds great you're using AES-256. That sounds just great. But what modes are you using? Are you using OFB, CFB, GCM, EAX, whatever? And most importantly, how are you storing the keys for the encryption? And what source of entropy are you using when you're doing the encryption? And uh, we got all kind of odd answers back and forth. We got, we got answers back like, well, what modes? We just told you we're using AES. And um, so we, okay, so we, oh, I think we found something here. We said, okay. And um, by basically pushing their arm, we finally managed them to send out over uh, all the, or not all, but some internal documentation describing the protocol between the actual alarm system, which is the box that sits on the branch, and talks to the alarm central. And you have to note also, it's not just the alarm, it's the key to the door. This is remote. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you can turn off the alarm, uh, turn on the alarm, but you can also open the doors to, to the branch, the external door. Yeah, and this is basically what we're talking about in this case. It's, it's typical embedded systems where you have uh, microcontrollers sitting on a, in a PCB that you put into some uh, you put it into a cabinet somewhere, and it lives a very lonely life for 25, 30 years, doing important stuff. And as I said, in, in this case, it actually it detects when somebody breaks a window or opens something, and it can also receive commands to say that you open this door or, or whatnot. Uh, and, and these kind of things you find everywhere, uh, and they're doing a lot of important security. And this is a system that is made for highly sensitive uh, sites, basically. Uh, and we, don't, we know that it's it doing AES-256, really, really good stuff. And, and as Freak and, and, and Peter said, we finally got some design documents. And, and I was brought into this project, and I started reading the documents uh, and looking at this board and, and uh, discovered some of the interesting things. Yeah. And, and normally talking about uh, a couple of things, uh, and in this case, they have uh, they have authentication. Uh, they, they want to ensure that the, uh, when, when a, one of these machines sends out a command to a, to, to a central, it actually comes from the right place. Uh, you can't change a message. You can't substitute a message. Uh, and then also you can optionally add uh, confidentiality to it. You can't actually read the contents of a message. Uh, so it looked really good uh, in that case. Uh. Uh, but then, when I started reading the documentation and, and looking at what they're actually doing, I started to realize that, uh, well, this is not really working, is it? I started to find that they're using a random number generator for keys and for challenges that is not based on a random number generator that is actually safe. Uh, and I realized that they are not using 
cipher modes, block cipher modes that are actually working. They invented their own. There, there, are, there is a whole family of, of great, really working, and some quite few bad uh, cipher modes for block ciphers. But hey, we can invent our own. Uh, and then they use all kind of, of short fields and numbered stuff that you can actually brute force stuff. Uh, and, and it turns out that they actually are, are doing stuff that cancels out there. You, you can actually, uh, in this case, you can actually buy license to get confidentiality. But if you enable license, then the authentication doesn't work. Uh, so, so you get worse performance. Uh, that's kind of bad. And then this whole kind of this, and typically you see this, a lot of magic constants and trying to obfuscate code. We, uh, let's say, I, I take AES, for example, a great cipher, and then I try to be, I, I don't know anything about encryption, but I think I'm smart. So I try to do stuff with it to be, make it a little bit better. Uh, so secure by security, that actually decreases the security. No. Okay. And if you look at the first one, is the, uh, and that was asked, wh where is your source for entropy? Where, do, where, does you, wh where is the runner numbers and your keys come from? And it turns out that they, they've actually selected what's called a linear congenital generator. It's a very nice random generator that can generate very nice uniform random numbers. Uh, it's very common for non-cryptographic applications. Uh, the problem is that, that if I can uh, look at a couple of, of numbers for it, uh, that means I can actually in identify the state of the... It's a pseudo-random generator. So if, if I can figure out the start value, then I can figure out all the other values before it and after uh, and coming after it. Uh, so you're not supposed to use this as a, something for security. And it's been known from the 70s. And this, this thing was designed in the 90s. So yeah. they should have known. But anyway, uh, and they're using a random generator that has 16-bit uh, uh, state. So you can only have 2 to 16 uh, values of, rip, uh, of, of values and, uh, at best. But they're not using one that is much, much worse. And we're actually uh, yeah. still selling this piece of junk of hardware yeah. in 2014. So. Yeah. So just to, just to yeah, if you could next one, please. Yeah. Next one? Yeah. yeah. This is typical. If you, if you take, take some data from, from a ra good random generator and plot it, this is what it look, look like, something like that. And if you take that, their ones, you, if you, I, I, you put in the line here, that's, but you, you, if you can see, it actually predicted what works pretty well. You can actually see that there's these lines going like that, are you seeing that? That means that actually there's this pattern repeating over and over again. So they have much, much less than 2 to 16 values in their data. And this is their basis for the keys, basically. This is scary stuff. Yeah. So I just took it. There, there's a, a program called Die Harder, which you can use to, to test random generators. And this is the, just the result if it took their one that they're using in this application. And you can see it mostly fail. So I think good, I this, this one result is just weak. That's pretty good. I, but, I, but, yeah. It actually fails every test except for the one that's weak. I yeah, think. I think yeah. Yeah, so, it's, it's, so it's not totally worst. It's uh, almost. <laughs> OK. Yeah. And, and then, as I said, they're, they're using AES-256. Though it turns out that they're actually using AES-128. Using AES well, uh, who is 128 bits among friends? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a so few bits here and there. Yeah, and, and if you know what AES is, it's a block cipher, it's a pure function. If I take a key and a block of data, 16 bytes of data, and I put it in there, I get an encrypted block out of it. I'm going to get the same block out every time. Uh, and that has consequences. Uh, this is a good example from Wikipedia. Everybody's seen this one, uh, the penguin. And uh, basically, if you look at the upper left corner, you've got white background there, and you get these striped patterns. And this is why we have uh, cipher modes, uh, feedback modes, uh, like, for example, CBC. Uh, uh, you actually basically take the, the, the incoming message block, and you take the previous message blocks, and you combine them with an XOR, for example. In this case, CBC, you actually do that. And then you get a state in there. So you actually, if you send in the same block many, many times, it will be encrypted uh, not only next slide, please. Not only with, with, with itself, but, but the state of previous blocks. Uh, 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 and, and, but hey, there's, uh, there's a lot of modes, but these guys decided, well, let's invent our own one. And not feedback, but feed forward instead. This, nobody's done this before. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is really interesting yeah, this work. Is, this is know. unique. They should have paid in it. So they're probably going to. Uh, 
so, so in this idea, they actually for instead of uh, uh, this actually they forward the clear text uh, to modify the the cipher text instead. So if you take the uh, uh, so, so you see this one, and and this one that, that really scared me <laughs> because the point is that that it's okay if you take a sensitive message and you put it through a cipher, then then you have something that is you, you can that you that is secure. And then you can bring it back, and you can do stuff. But in this case, you have actually have clear text stuff going, passing by the cipher like this, which is scary in itself. Uh, uh, so, so uh, you were well so pissed when you found <laughs> this. <laughs> I, I, I actually called and said, "This can't be real. They must be doing this on purpose." Yeah, you were thought uh, we were yeah, on candid camera. He said, "This yeah. is so bad. It, yeah. it can't be true." Yeah. Uh, so, and, and the thing is that if you actually think about this, uh, if you take the next slide, you, you start doing the analysis, this, it actually don't have any state. If you send in multiple blocks of the same one, they actually won't be able to actually modify anything. So, but, and the cool thing is that all this doesn't matter at all. If you go back to the previous slide, because the mix function there is actually so bad, and it depends on a magic number from that random generator we talked about. So the whole AS thingy doesn't even matter. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they act because they invented their own mixing function. Instead of using XOR, which is very strange uh, and hard and complicated, they invented their own, uh, which sort of might get the whole AS thing. Yeah. So, yeah, next one. Uh, and then they have the message authentication, which, and a message authentication for embedded system is really, really important. I, I usually say that. Uh, if you are designing an embedded system, uh, confidentiality is probably not your most important concern. Authentication is that you actually know that, for example, if you have a power meter, that the, the amount of power that you consumed is actually correct and comes from the right meter. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of really good algorithms, HMAC, CBC MAC, GMAC, all by some, Polit 1305, for example, really nice. Uh, and the thing is that the MAC, uh, the MAC tag is, is a number, a, a signature for, for the data. Uh, it has to be big enough so that you can actually brute force it. Uh, and typically it's 64, 96, 128, uh, for example. So next place. So ba basically this is what, we, what you usually see, that you have your message, uh, and then you have a key, a secret key that both the sender and receiver knows, and you process something like HMAX SHA-256, and you get, a, you get a Mac, a tag that you add to your message and you send it over to the receiver. Yeah. And it turns out they're using a 32-bit Mac. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I can probably brute force that pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's based on one of those feedback forward things. Uh, so, and it turns out that actually can reduce to a single constant uh, uh, that is like eight bits. Uh. <laughs> so AES is totally relevant in this case. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they're using AES 256, uh, AES not 28, not 256. Uh, the key is generated from a 24-bit master code. Uh, so, so the key is entered with mac at most 24 bits. Uh, and, and that is seeded into that pure engine we talked about. But that was only 16 bits, so we're down to 16 bits. Uh, S and then you can, you can actually, it actually stores old master codes. So you can actually force an old master code. So you actually can't do rekeying of it. Right? This is so broken. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, it's sold to sensitive applications. <laughs> <laughs> Many. <laughs> yeah. So this is, yeah. Yeah, this was basically, this is taken from, from uh, the, the report to the customer. Uh, we're basically saying that uh, we do not recommend uh, relying on the security of the features in the system should be viewed as an unprotected system. If the system is to be used, separate communication security mechanism should be used, should be added. So basically the customer absolutely need to have something like an IPsec tunnel going from the alarm system to the alarm central. And um, the really dash of it is basically it is not ready for production use. This is basically the worst crap we've ever seen, I guess. Yeah, but expensive. And, and think about this sentence for a while. <laughs> These guys manufacture alarm systems that spread globally all over the world. It's probably uh, it's, they're probably one of those controllers sitting here uh, protecting this 
Very yeah, you can actually walk around in stores or whatever, and you can actually see these boxes see spread all over, all over. <laughs> <laughs> we were crying. Um, after a long, long debacle with, the, with Paycom, the, the manufacturer from Australia, we finally got them at, to, to admit, well, and, and finally they said, okay, seriously, guys, we, we surrender. You're correct, it is utterly crap. Uh, however, we will not issue a patch. We won't fix this. So uh, we will tell the customers to start using our new base station, and they will have to download a new firmware that can make it possible to use the new base station, and they will have to pay for it. So, If I can add. add so that's, that's really a good, uh, good way I, of solving I, I the problem. I assume when we wrote the first report that, uh, that th these are the findings, and I was expecting some sort of discussion. About and then I said, yeah, everything's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically what they're telling the customers, yeah, um, instead of using Windows 7, you could upgrade to Windows 10. But we are selling you Windows 7. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but well, you can also... Uh, uh, grasp the magnitude of this. I mean, this was one client, and they had uh, several hundreds, if not thousands, of sites. And imagine all the other big companies or all the other organizations. And each one of these, when you're going to flash the firmware, you need to have someone out at the site, uh, someone from a security company, basically, to, um, to provide for the security. So it's kind of a very expensive process to reflash the firmware. Yeah, so a little bit of lessons learned, I, I think, is that don't use pseudo random generators not to design for, uh, for security. There are some really, really good ones that you can use, for example, based on, on AES. And, and they uh, shouldn't have been known bad for more than no. 30 years. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah you can actually, you, you, can, you can grab, for example, Bruce Schneier's old classic red book, uh, Apply Crypto, and you can actually turn up and, and look at linear conigon. Don't use this for, for crypto stuff. And that was published 20 years before they designed the system. Uh, so, and, and don't invent your own ciphers and cipher modes. There are so many good ones that you can choose from, so why spend the time for it? Uh, yeah, yeah, my yeah. favorite in this was basically they were neutering AES-128 down to 24 bits. Yeah. So it was AES-24. That's three <laughs> characters. Yeah. Do you think that's hard to brute force? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if you think that uh, feedback is, is, is uh, backwards and, and, and old school <laughs> and you want to go forward, <laughs> instead, don't do that don't in block ciphers. Please. It actually doesn't work. Uh, uh. Uh. And, and uh, as I said, brute forcing, uh, uh, short Mac fields, 32-bit is uh, uh, not uh, the way to go. Sweet 32. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, next. Yeah. Uh, this is actually a picture. <laughs> I, I took it when I was skiing down in Italy, so it's my picture. It's, uh, this is an Italian way of thinking of a secure lock, and it reminded me so much of this alarm system, so I just had to take the picture. Okay. S questions? And the best question gets this very, very nice book, by the way, uh, about Arne Berling, the Swedish crypto giant. So, come on, ask your questions. Uh, the question was, if, did we look at the next version? I, I guess you're assuming the updated firmware. Yeah, we were actually graciously allowed to examine the protocol of the, the updated firmware that goes to the, the Paycom IS solution, which is the uh, fixed solution. We found some problems there, not a major, any, not any showstoppers, they had some issues. I think yeah. they fixed a couple of them. They still have a few on the backlog, but there's nothing that's basically says uh, th there's no show showstoppers around. No. But, but if, if I can add just what, what they basically did in terms of crypto, that they sort of they threw out all of the, the homegrown invented stuff and it just basically follow standard stuff, which makes it easier just also to, 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 to sell to customers to explain you can actually look at this stuff. Uh, and it's easier to implement, so that's a good lesson. That don't do this. It, it, there's so many good stuff to use, and they, that's what it did. It was really good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. a really yeah. good lesson yeah. to learn. Don't yeah. don't invent your own crypto yeah. or hash functions. Yeah, but also uh, one lesson is also to be curious. I mean, if we didn't have uh, asked all the questions, we could have uh, 
accepted the answer of AS256, right, and go move on. How many times do you do that? Probably quite often. Because you don't have the time or, or uh, the resources to actually go down and dig down in this kind of stuff. So be curious. Yeah, and that's a good point, Peter, to make. Because in an audit like this, you have like hundreds and hundreds of questions that you ask your customer. And this is just one of them. And so it was this close, actually, that we missed this one. So um, well, well, you, you just have to stick there and, and go for your gut feeling. We have a question. Okay, how, the question is, how difficult was it for us to explain to the customer that an IP VPN isn't really private? Yeah. Um, it was a bit challenging, <laughs> but, uh, but it finally worked. Any other questions? Over here. But, but it's a good oh. question, because I'd, I'd say 99% of the customer that we meet when we're doing audits they're saying, we have MPLS, we have an IPv pen, we are secure. <laughs> yeah, I frigging hate the guy that nicked it IPv pen. Just call it MPLS or whatever. Sorry, question is, yeah. Um, test, test, yeah. yeah. Um, have you ever seen or heard uh, anyone doing this feed forward thing? It seems like an original invention. Or <laughs> <laughs> to, me, to me, I have never seen before or after <laughs> any doing this ingenious thing, no. Yeah. It was as, unique. As I said, Joachim, was, he was furious when I called him after the initial discovery, and he, he was really mad. Yeah. Someone is actually trying purposely trying to do this, make this bad. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, the question, what, did they get the patent? <laughs> I'm sure they did. <laughs> uh, have you looked at other alarm vendors, uh, the big ones, at least? Yeah, I've seen some, some syst other systems, yeah. yeah. Well, this is unique in this case, <laughs> <laughs> at least in, for, in, the feed for, in, in, the, in the forward sense. It's kind of scary because as if you read on Paycom's uh, own uh, homepage, it basically says that we spread these systems all over the world. There are thousands and thousands of installations. And I guess at least now we're not the only one knowing about these stuff. And it's kind of convenient if you, if you want to shut down the alarm system or open a door if you want to do a burglary somewhere. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And, and like we said, it's not like a small company. It's spread all over the world, and you can find installations everywhere in Sweden Seven. if you just go around, go around looking. Yeah. Not necessarily this board, but uh, probably some of them. But yeah. yeah. And there is a CVE out. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. there is a CVE yeah. we should. And, uh, we actually, this was 2014, but due to uh, responsible disclosure and stuff like that, we had to sit on it for like almost two years, yeah. one and a half year, two years, something like that. But finally, it's out at least. Yeah. And this is the first time we're telling anyone about this, except we've done it before on NDA to legal authorities in Europe and um, obviously to customers and the partners. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. The, these units, uh, are they uh, Wi-Fi connected with this protocol enabled? No, they, they, they are connected through uh, uh, either GPRS as a backup link or uh, the actual uh, Ethernet, more or less. Uh, we should probably mention the, the the board you saw on the picture, we bought out of eBay for how much was it? Uh, bucks? We bought it from Israel for uh, 600 Swedish crowns. Yeah. So buy one, go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and uh, every, yes, like Peter said, uh, they are connected uh, through normal Ethernet. So the Ethernet cable from the alarm system, alarm uh, Ethernet cables from the video links and from the data goes in 
and then gets split up in the different VRFs. So in that same sense, the same goes, I mean, if the Ethernet would be down and you can argue, okay, about what about GPRS and stuff like that, and the same issue is going to be there with uh, your uh, APN or whatever. It's not going to be that private either, probably. Yeah, and also the stuff that Karsten Noll, I think he showed at that CCC mm. two years ago, so GPRS might even be a, a worse solution than actually going with uh, Ethernet. Mm. And the protocol actually being totally broken. Any other questions? the IPsec to uh, to uh, achieve confidentiality, I guess, from the carrier uh, actors. Then, but did, did you suggest anything to kind of segment the different sites from each other? Well, <laughs> that was actually yeah. The question is, uh, did we um, uh, talk about the customer using IPsec from the site site to site or from endpoint I to endpoint, and then also segment the sites off from each other? Yeah, yeah. that's what. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the question is twofold here. Uh, of course, you should uh, when you have a broadening protocol like this. Okay, they didn't know, but uh, still, when you're using a carrier like the MPLS st stuff, even though you don't know what the protocol are, you pr should probably uh, use IPsec to to protect your data because one of these days, some guy is going to implement something new that you don't know, and that way you have a secure channel. But uh, also. A uh, recommendation here would also be to like segment and uh, look at the traffic patterns. In this case, it's very simple because it's a star configuration. Everyone talks in. It's uh, never any, any, ever need for, to talk from one site to another site. So that would be uh, extremely easy to implement in a firewall or uh, just uh, sheer routing or whatever. So it's uh, kind of two things in, in one. And yeah, both of them, uh, both of them are recommendations to the, to the client customer. That, uh, that was, that was it's, it's a good question because it basically what it ended up was doing being a soft recommendation for the customer that you need to look over your procurement process because the reason they didn't have any isolation between the sites which a customer thought they had is because the procurement uh, was bad. They didn't give the right demands when they purchased the MPLS cloud. They probably didn't know. So the provider said, well, there's no demands for separate, separating the sites, so why should we spend money on doing it? Because the customer didn't have any demands from it. So that was a feedback to the customer that you need to be better in, on procurement. You need to, better, uh, to, to, to have your demands better, your, what you need actually, from both a business perspective but also from a security perspective. Was that an answer to your question? Yeah, yeah but I think that th this bro broken protocol is a perfect example to, as to why that IPsec would be needed. Because you assume and you don't know. And when you start poking at it, well, so. Mm. Any more questions? Say again, please. Sorry. So. The question is, was it a consultant helping this company out, or was it someone in-house that they invented this? You Wonderful. mean from Payacom, who did the... The forwarding. Depend, uh, the, judging from the documentation and the communication we had with, uh, finally, when we got hold of the engineers in Australia, it's invented in-house. We, we don't really know, but we... But we don't know we, for sure. We probably. Yeah. Any more questions? Or should we drink beer? Beer. Yeah. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.